seconds before you came to us, the police arrived. I should explain we're on a public street. We're exactly two miles away from Tiananmen Square, uh, and yet the police are here. They wouldn't be on any normal day. We have every right to be here on this street uh, to report. seconds before you came to us, the police arrived. I should explain we're on a public street. We're exactly two miles away from Tiananmen Square, uh, and yet the police are here. They wouldn't be on any normal day. We have every right to be here on this street uh, to report, and on any other day, they wouldn't stop us. When we filmed from the car, we were also stopped. And again on the street, we were ordered to leave the area. Every move we made was watched by undercover police who kept a record of what we were doing. What happened right here and just down there in Tiananmen Square simply isn't discussed. The subject is so sensitive we're not allowed to film anywhere near the square. This is about as close as we can get to the square because these plainclothes officers are using their umbrellas to try and stop our view so that we cannot actually do any videotaping here. So. Uh, in Beijing at the moment, there is no, uh, whoops, there is no official commemoration of uh, June the 4th at all. Uh, there's no memorial allowed, no vigils uh, are allowed either. Uh, anyone who, who might want to remember June the 4th uh, is probably being watched by the police. Well, well, we're being stopped from filming quite clearly. We haven't even got close to the square. So you can really see from this how tricky it is as a foreign journalist trying to cover uh, the Tiananmen anniversary. And that those are examples from YouTube uh, from uh, you know, a variety of years. Uh, the story is all the same. Um, uh, so I'm just going to uh, talk you through a, bit, a few of the figures uh, that, that I discovered when I surveyed uh, journalists about the kind of experience they had. Quick academic disclaimer that uh, because of the sensitivity of the topic, it's been quite difficult to find a lot of information about it. But as you can see, um, I asked 60 foreign correspondents about their experience covering the anniversary. Of those 60, three quarters reported that they had had uh, interference from the authorities. When you started to break it down and look at the type of interference, um, we found that 57% uh, had two or more types of interference from the authorities. And the main type, of course, as you saw from the video, was restricting access to the square. Um, or restricting access to sources, uh, about a fifth of journalists had official warnings or complaints about their coverage, sometimes before uh, publication, sometimes after publication from consulates and embassies overseas. Um, and uh, in a, about a fifth of cases, their sources were either detained or harassed, and in 16%, the journalists themselves were detained or harassed. So what does it tell us? This really underlines, I think, the determination of the Chinese authorities to stop Tiananmen anniversary reporting by the foreign press or to control it. Um, we see different arms of the state working to limit coverage. Uh, so often you see the police, state security, and the plainclothes policemen that you saw on the video. You see foreign ministry, uh, consulates and embassies overseas. Uh, and all of them are working together to make it very difficult to report anything except the, ver the most repressive Tiananmen story. Often there's no access to memory carriers, the people like activists, the Tiananmen mothers, um, and people who took part in the protests. All of those are blocked. So really, the type of story that journalists can tell is not the story of the movement itself. It is the story of repression, um, a, an idea of kind of... Um, just the crackdown that, uh, that they themselves um, experience. Um, and I, I'm going to give you a few quick takeaways. The first takeaway, and these are quotes from the survey that the Chinese gave. One is that
I had reports of all different types of uh, examples of repression. For example, people, uh, there was one person who, uh, their cameraman tried to move someone to get him out of the way, and uh, the person he tried to move uh, said he had been assaulted and uh, called the police, and the entire crew was detained and spent about four hours in the police station. Uh, in recent years, uh, journalists are reporting more facial recognition cameras, and um, so they're finding it harder to uh, report in the square itself because they get spotted so quickly. Um, repression is often unreported or underreported by journalists. Interestingly, a third of journalists said they didn't report the repression that they themselves experienced or they underreported it. And often this was because of journalistic norms and practices. They didn't want to make themselves the centre of the story um, and they felt that their personal experience, you know, it was self-aggrandizement or perhaps there was a code of conduct that meant they weren't able to include that in their stories. So often they didn't uh, report that at all. Um, so that was an interesting finding. And then the final finding that I thought was very interesting was that exposure to repression breeds cynicism. So I asked a very open-ended question, what kind of impact do you think your anniversary reporting has? And interestingly, about a quarter of respondents said no impact at all. And that was the cohort that had spent the longest time in China. They'd been on average 13.3 years in China. Whilst and that was also the same cohort. None of them changed their reporting to, to reflect the kind of repressive practices they themselves had experienced. Whilst uh, people who thought that their reporting had amplified memories or renewed memories had been in China for an appreciably shorter time, 8.6 years, and about 60% of them had changed their coverage. They said things like the interference became a part of most of our stories so you could say, in a way, it created the news of the day. So, uh, it, it, in conclusion, I would say that the authorities are shaping Tiananmen coverage through this campaign of intimidation. And it really has kind of a reductive effect on the story that journalists can tell. It's really shrunk the Tiananmen story down to one repre repre repressive trope. Uh, you hear time and time again about the repression, but you don't hear the story of the movement. You also uh, tend not to hear the story of what happened outside Beijing and other provinces. Um, and, and this is, again, this is another quote. It can be self-defeating because, uh, to a certain extent, the, these kind of stories do also keep the reporting alive. But I do think that it... Um, underlines the government's message that political activism is dangerous because we hear the same story time and time again uh, from journalists. Um, and I would just end by saying, because this is put on by a journalism school, a uh, note to journalists. I think uh, one finding which is really interesting is this idea of transparency and detachment. Should you report these things that happen to yourself or not? And I think it's really interesting that people who tended to report repressive experiences that they had themselves found that their work, they believed their work had more impact. So in a way, I think it's a way of taking back journalistic agency that has been taken away by repressive, uh, repressive practices. And so, you know, I do think that's something that journalists can bear in mind. Um, there are also other ways that journalists try to get around these uh, limits on their action. Uh, uh, they often do their reporting very early, they try to talk to people overseas, and they try to circumvent all the restrictions in this way. And in that way, I do think that reporting on these hidden memories can be an act of resistance to intimidation and silence. Thank you. And I'm just going to introduce my colleague, uh, Dr. Fu Kingwa, who's going to talk about his research on uh, social media and censorship. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, great pleasure to uh, give this 
talk today here. Um, as a last week, last week usually I'm a bit hard to convince the, the audience, especially if we have two excellent speakers before me. Uh, but I'm a bit lucky because today I have a lot of images to show in this PowerPoint. In the coming ten years, a lot of images that that give me some tools to impress our um, audience. So as you can see, uh, the talk today is uh, tweets and memories. China senses are coming after me. Let's talk about my research in the past nine years to investigate China social media as well as the censorship system in China. Okay, um, here is all the things we already know. So China has the one of the most uh, sophisticated and intensive censorship system in the, in the world. Uh, you can have a lot of different names of their strategy to try to suppress information. Um, great firewall, real name registration systems, uh, social credit system, uh, cyber security law, uh, crackdown of KOL, you name it. You can see a lot of different kind of strategy uh, the government used in the past. So, not surprising, you can see uh, uh, reporter Report Bowler ranked China as one of the worst uh, media freedom countries in the world, 176 out of 180s. So namely, imposing a social model in China based on control of news, information, and online surveillance tools. Freedom House in 2018 named the worst abuser of internet freedom. George Soros, a few months ago, he uh, speech at the uh, World Economic Forum and named Xi Jinping the most dangerous opponent of the open society. So these are all we know well. But the question today I ask, I want to ask is, despite all this, why still we have a large group of uh, social media users in China that continue to post about the uh, 1989 uh, Tiananmen Square crackdown every year and in early June. I have been tracking all the information over the decades and found consistently there's a pattern that people keep posing and retweeting and writing about the June 4th. Why? Why they don't scare about all these things? Why don't they fear of all kinds of measures, uh, censorship, penalty, crackdown? This is the question I want to ask in this study. Okay, th that's why the purpose of Weibo Scope, where we uh, start a project. So, we tracking post publication censorship of uh, 30,000, uh, 50,000 social influence accounts and also a lot of random samples. So, just a little bit of explanation of what is post censorship. Post censorship means they have another called pre censorship. Pre censorship means you key in some keywords that touch on Jun Fog, touch on Dalai Lama, just touch on Kuala uh, Lumpur. Uh, These are the, some of the keywords that they know and understand they can't post. They even can't post it, they can't even save it. Even we can't save it at the, at the draft. So this is what we call post censorship. You can't even publish it. But they find a way, once they find a way to publish it, after a short while, their posts were censored. So these are what we call the post censorship. So basically our strategy to try to track this kind of post censorship information from the online uh, from social media. So we develop a program we keep continuing retreating and check the accounts timeline and compare the timeline to a previous version. And then we can check the differences and then find out those posts uh, if we find the error message from permission denied, we mark it as a censorship. So we make use of this strategy. We since 2011, we track 700,000 censor posts until now. So we get a really uh, large data set. But before the people talk about big data, we start in 2011 drawing big data from the wave. So, but now, uh, this year, we, we start to look at specifically on June 4th related posts. 
So we manually identify all the image that attached to form clothes between June uh, 1st to the 4th. Uh, during the whole period of time of 2012 uh, to 2018 from our archive. So I want to emphasize it just, just a small part of our archive because we have a lot of clothes that basically don't come with image. And a lot of clothes basically not directly related to June 4th, but we just focus on this image to look at uh, what it is about. So that's why I also uh, want to announce today, today is the official launch of this uh, first ever al algorithm, uh, not algorithm, uh, archive of the uh, sensor uh, Terman uh, program. So we already put it on three different uh, platforms, on uh, and Pinterest and also uh, Instagram and also on official website. So please, you can go online and check, you can have a full list of 1,056 Sense our image, you can't find it anymore, anywhere uh, on social media anymore. So, but now we already put it online and um, on this. Okay, but anyway, but we talk about 1056. What does it mean? What, 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 what kind of idea to look at this? So, what we did before is let's just print out all these posts and stick it on the wall and see what happened. So, end up we get this picture. So, we we, 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 we put some of them, not all, they stick on the wall and then take a photo like this and then I create a small video. So I just 15 minutes and 40 seconds, so I don't just want to show you what is it uh, about. So just a pretty short video, so it would come up very soon. Here we go. Square uh, crackdown. 
So that's also we find the most mentioned moment uh, appear on the sensor post. But not just the most mentioned uh, uh, post. We also find that they have the most largest number of derivatives. Let's see. Uh, so let's see what. So we found more than two dozen different derivative worlds. And you, if you're a creative world, you now understand that based on the original, they develop further different versions of the kind kind. So this is what the image that we get to show they're creatively using the same symbol and then create different ways to talk about the issue. Of course, these are all then sensor. But it also shows the way that you make use of a lot of creativity and humor and also uh, different kinds of symbolic uh, message to tell their own way of uh, story. So, candle is also one of the most uh, 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 popular way that people try to uh, 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 talk about uh, June 4th during that period of time and at that time lighting candle became a sensitive, it's a very sensitive at that time. So we can see a lot of uh, candles during that period of time will just rapidly sense. At some point even that the that's uh, seen on wave will change their emoji uh, list. They have the emoji list that include all the different kinds of laughing face, angry face, they remove the candle. <laughs> so that that also comes to that point that they try to erase all the things that led the people to come on great the event. Condemnation is also a one another type, typical type of uh, pose that we find in the archive. And Li Pang is uh, unfortunately he, he is the one of the major target as he is the only one alive politician right now who are to be linked to the Tiananmen Square crackdown decision. Um, uh, this is one of the typical uh, case that they the targeting the politicians that need to take responsibility. Not just him, Deng Xiaoping. Deng is also one is also one of the major targets that keep touching the that we get fired in the hard um, Talk about Hong Kong. We, we, we are in. Uh, Hong Kong, Kong, that we also focus on Kong. And we find, at least in our archive, 1056, we find 13, 30% of the link, basically linked to Kong. Kong. They talk about the issue of Kong. Kong. And it, uh, it's uh, important because here is the only place in the world, I think, has the largest scales of collective action to um, for, for the June 4th and, and also for the issue. So, a lot of people try to think things like this is one of the uh, uh, examples that they, 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 thank, they say thank you to Hong Kong because that is the only place in the, uh, uh, you may not know, but, but this is basically the soil of Hong Kong, China, that you can uh, organize this kind of collective uh, activity uh, on this. Um, this is one, also one of the most ridiculous kinds of um, activities that we find is trying to make a response to some type of current uh, issue. So this is about the, their political suppression about censorship. So for those non-Chinese speakers, I just give a, do a, a little translation. Basically the screen cap of the in search interface of Weibo and the people type to that. And then return, I talk in the law and regulation today, the result uh, can't be displaced. And if you want to try other keywords, you can try again. If this is their suggestion. So that person say, I think this is a joke. And then that uh, post gets sense. So I just want to emphasize that because in the previous field posts, they are basically talking about the past. They talk about the history. But now they talk about the thing now, the current suppression. The time it respond. This is a political suppression. And not just this, and not just this is a Tiananmen mother. So people want to support him. I think Tiananmen mothers is only a group in China. Basically, they can open and they have some kind of activities in China to uh, come on, right?
have the, the, the camera and track that. So people want to support them, uh, but these kind of posts are uh, often uh, censored. Uh, so that's a, another type. That basically they not talk about past, but talk about uh, uh, now. Okay, these are some of the uh, observation that supposed to be right between the paper. But I want to say that it's it, it, back to the question why. Why do people still write about it? They know everything they post after a few hours, everything will, will go on. So why do they still want to post? So just one of the questions, one, one, one of the answers to this, it really is like they want to create a, a signal. A, a lot of political scientists may know if there's a lot of cost signaling theory, the government wants to create a signal to let the people know this is something you can do, something you, something you can't do. But now, I, I, I would, this is also the citizens want to have a signal. They want to have a signal to the government. Some we never forget. And also, some people should take the responsibility. So that's why this is what we call, I would call it, this is what we call the signal of the citizen, no matter how weak, no matter how short, but there is some kind of signal they want to send. And also, as a kind of response to the, what they call, I would call the counter discourse. They don't they disagree with the state discourse. They protest against the state discourse. That's why they need to create the counter discourse versus the censorship as well as their propaganda. So, as also you can see a lot of very, I would say, seriously painful tactics. That we can see across, you can go online and see all the thousand and fifty-six posts. A lot of very interesting, humorous, um, uh, in, uh, I would say the seriously paper taxes will respond to all the things. And also at the end of the day, no matter the thing is talk about the past and or talk about now, they are talk they are, have the same motive to try to have to what I call the justice system. They want to continue to respond to this um, uh, about the government. Okay, so last thing is uh, acknowledgement. I need to acknowledge uh, uh, Virginia Joe is our research assistant. She helped substantially in this project, do the, all the data coding, categorization, computation, and supported by Open Technology Fund. The last thing is important, uh, that I follow all the ethical rules, so it's all the image that I post online, I follow the rules, and already the personal identifier will be based on the identified rules. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to have all the uh, panelists and Samson, <laughs> come up on stage. Please have a seat up here. <laughs> yes, I'm censoring. You know, I, I, excuse me, I turn off the system. Okay, we're back. <laughs> okay, in the interest of time, I won't be in a funny time to interact with the audience here, but I want to thank all of our uh, presenters for that. It was really interesting to hear uh, the first presentation from uh, Edmund and Sampson. I guess that's your joint research project. Um, which really gave us a look at the demographics of the people who now who still come to the vigils there. I was particularly interested in the idea of the localists and how they may have a different view. Perhaps they have the idea that we can't change China, but maybe we should just concentrate on changing Hong Kong. That was kind of interesting. And Louisa, is, uh, I was a correspondent in Beijing, so I know how sensitive that is to go try to go to Tiananmen Square any time near the anniversary. So I, I was quite... Uh, uh, amused to find that the Umbrella Movement has a new name in Beijing. 
that came, came off, obviously, looking, looking at those social media posts were fantastic. I remember the, the, uh, the picture of the rubber duck in front of the tanks, but I guess even that's censored now, so uh, that's it's to be expected. Uh, before we get to the audience questions, uh, uh, first of all, uh, just a couple of uh, quick rules. I'll be the one to call on you from the audience, put your hand up, and we will, we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, I just ask that you please uh, wait for the microphone to come around. One of my colleagues will have a microphone. Uh, please only state your name, and if you have an affiliation, state your affiliation, and please ask one question um, so we can get to as many as possible. That, and so that means please don't ask a question with three parts to it. <laughs> and uh, a question has a question mark at the end of it. Uh, so please, no statements, speeches, or filibusters. Uh, we will try to cut those off as quickly as possible to, so we can get to as many people as we can. And then I'll, we'll take the, uh, I will take the role of moderator to call on one person because we have a very special guest in the audience. If I can find him, where is Cedric? Oh, he's in, right in the middle there. If you can get a microphone to Cedric. Cedric uh, Alviani, he's the East Asia Bureau Director for uh, Reporters Without Borders or Reporters Sans Frontières, which is a press freedom advocacy group. And uh, since we have uh, the advantage of having him here in the audience, I would like to ask you the first question, if I can, Cedric, which is uh, from your perspective, let me, let me put it this way. I know China has now got a heavy footprint around the region in Asia, in East Asia. Uh, it, uh, how has that affected how other countries now cover Tiananmen Square or the anniversary of Tiananmen Square? Thank you very much, and thanks for the speakers. Well, we just published, uh, and you can find on our website, a 52-page report on how the Chinese authorities uh, have a concerted plan to impact on the media outside the Chinese borders. This is quite chilling because the report was only made with public information, so we can imagine that there's actually much more than that. Uh, 10 years ago, the question in this room would have been how can we impact on the situation in China and improve the freedom of the Chinese citizen to uh, access to information. Now the question is how can democracies protect themselves from the influence of China outside its border in the media. Uh, there have been tries, for example, uh, from Chinese companies to uh, purchase, uh, I do not know if it has succeeded or not, to purchase some uh, media agency owing the copyrights of some pictures uh, of the Tiananmen events. Uh, this is a concern. There are also concerns that uh, through purchase in, uh, in the media, through um, intimidation sometimes from the Chinese ambassadors, for example, and through business ties, the Chinese authorities would just manage to suppress uh, potentially negative coverage of uh, China abroad. So now the question is not only how could the Chinese citizens hear about Tiananmen, is will people in 20 years all around the world still be able to hear about that event and to hear about what's uh, going on in China? It's a bit scary if the censorship now could extend beyond China's borders. That's really, that's really absolutely fascinating. Thank you for that, Cedric. Thank you. Uh, can we see hands for questions? And again, make sure you have a question mark at the end. Let's see the green shirt right here in the second row. Hi, um, I'm Joyce. I'm an alumni of the MJ program. Um, my question is for um, any of you uh, who gave a speech, really, um, especially the first speaker. I was wondering, I'm, I'm very interested in the loss of memory and parents' responsibilities with that. So, like, um, my parents never told me about um, Tiananmen, and I didn't learn about it until I went to college abroad. Um, and I, I lived um, in Shanghai my entire life before that. And I was wondering, uh, from your conversations with parents at the vigils, um, did you talk to many? And what do they see as their responsibility to pass on that memory to their kids? And um, have you guys also uh, looked at a lot of mainland parents who chose to not share that? And whether you guys could share about that, yeah. Maybe I can direct your question to Stephen to start here. And I, I hate to put you on the spot here, but are you old enough to remember anything about Tiananmen Square? Or probably not, right? No, born after. We didn't ask that specific question, uh, uh, ask whether parents, uh, ha whether they pass on the memories. So our research uh, is more focused on how the vigil itself pass on the memories. 
Uh, I, I believe that there were, for example, Francis Lee uh, is a researcher also who works a lot on uh, Tiananmen Square. He, he works on the communicative process more, on how uh, uh, the participants got the memory through the media or through the schools, which is very important. Uh, how uh, you know, a lot of high school students actually learned about um, the event uh, in high school, especially in liberal studies. Um, the year 2009, where there is sudden jump in the number of participation, a lot of young people followed their teachers to go there. So I, I believe that um, it's very important, uh, but we did not assess that directly. So our, our main focus is on whether how useful the, the vigil was, and we, we, we found that it's actually very useful in passing on the memories through the vigils itself. Uh, Louisa, did you have a comment on that? So I was just going to say a couple of words about uh, parents within China, um, because that was something that I uh, was looking at when I reported my book. And I was really interested in the fact that many parents within China, even if they had been part of the movement themselves, they decided not to tell their children because they felt that this knowledge was not useful. It was perhaps even dangerous to their children. And I think the most extreme case that I came across was uh, quite a well-known artist called Shen Qi. And he, um, when in 1989, as a protest against the crackdown, he uh, used a, a chopper and chopped off his own little finger as an act of protest. And when I interviewed him, his son was 12 years old. And I asked him, um, you know, what did you say to your son about what happened to your hand? And he was really embarrassed, and he just kind of laughed it off. And then he said, uh, well, actually, I just joke. I told him that uh, I left it on the bus. <laughs> and I said, yeah, he's 12. Surely he doesn't believe that. And he said, I know he doesn't believe it, but I, I'm his parent, and I want to protect him, and that's why I'm not telling him. And I, I think that that's the case for many parents, who were, even those who are involved, that they just think this knowledge is not only not useful, but actually could be dangerous. Any other? Should we? Let's go back to the audience here for... Uh, Graham. Graham. <laughs> Hi, guys. It's nice to meet you. My name's Graham. And I'm curious, could you tell me a little bit more about... Has there been any success in covering uh, these events at other sites besides Tiananmen Square? Or have they met with similar levels of censorship? And I think, Louisa, would that probably be more of your question, I believe? If you don't want to go to Tiananmen Square, go elsewhere to cover yeah. something. Because actually, people may not realize that there were, there were protests outside of Beijing. They were going on in other cities, Shanghai, et cetera. What else? Yeah, I think it's really difficult to cover what happened outside Tiananmen Square. Um, because at the time, there was so little sort of so little documentation, so little reported and known about what happened in other cities that following it up after all these years is really very hard. And I mean, a, a whole chapter of my book was about what happened in Chengdu. And it was interesting that after my book came out, when I went um, and spoke in universities and I would show these, I used a lot of first-hand material. I used sort of diaries and photos from the time from people who had been there, but I also used, um, material for, from state-run media and from sort of confidential archives and things like that. Um, but I often found that when I showed these images, even people who'd been in Chengdu in 1989 were really shocked and surprised. And sometimes they'd even come up to me afterwards and say, do you know, until I saw your pictures, I forgot myself that I was there because I never talked about it again or because I... I hardly ever talked about it again, and then I just put it out of my mind, and I forgot about it. So I think that doing that kind of research within China is really, really very hard now. Um, and a lot of the material that I gained was actually from foreign people who had been foreign students in Chengdu at the time, who had bought all this big archives of photos and uh, diaries and written reports and reports that other people had given them and bought, taken it out of China. And actually, even the other day, I spoke to someone who was involved in this student movement in Chengdu, and he said, oh, I had all this, all this um, stuff, but you know, most of us destroyed all our evidence because even to leave it was, was, was you know, quite dangerous for us. 
So I think finding proof of what happened outside is, is really hard. Fascinating. Uh, blue shirt here. I know Lancy. Yeah, hi, I'm Nancy, I'm MJ from the GMSC, and uh, it's really a great honor to be here. Uh, actually, I come from mainland, and uh, my only memory to this accident is from my mother. My mother was a student in that year, and uh, she was just uh, going to the university for the first year, but because of that accident, the university had just uh, stopped, uh, um, just uh, stopped lots of students for they can't just go into the university, so my mother is actually uh, a victim uh, of this accident. And uh, actually, I have uh, problems for the Dr. Fu. Uh, I'm just wondering, since Twitter and Facebook, this kind of foreign media wants to come into China uh, market for a long time, and uh, under the Chinese government pressure, do you think the Twitter and uh, Facebook uh, will be just like Weibo, will uh, just agree the, 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 the censorship like the Chinese government do to the Weibo, okay. like but this is, yeah. Thank you for the question. I think definitely the, the, the company you name, that basically they would have a plan. They really want to uh, enter the China market again. And also, this also, um, uh, uh, even Google, they already escaped uh, the market once. And also, recently, there's a report about that. What they call Dragon 5 project, they want to re enter China again. So that's open secret, all the people want to go to China, but recently, I think because of the uh, 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 climate of the US-China uh, conflict, and also because of a lot of the new uh, cyber security law requirement, that required the service provider provide a, a lot of uh, access by the government, that make it basically virtually impossible, and morally impossible for those companies to enter China and work in, in such a uh, condition. And even, even they can access the market, I also don't think they have the strong competitive edge to compete with the uh, Xinjiang Weibo and especially Tencent, the uh, WeChat, because they already captured the market so well and create a, a critical mass of the market and also the payment uh, mark, uh, system. That really well established, that really hard for the competitive Presentations. And my name is Luqi. I come from the GMSC. Uh, so, uh, so my question is, um, since I've been working on a reporting uh, project on the on student evaluation of the June 1st incident, um, and I had chances to talk with some um, student leaders of major universities in Hong Kong, and therefore I got this idea that there seems to be a, a, a trend among university students in Hong Kong that they, they tend to commemorate um, local political events such as the Umbrella uh, Movement and the Fishful Revolution um, more to um, commemorating the Dream Force incident. And many of them told me that um, they, they, they are feeling increasingly disconnected with uh, the history of um, Dream Force. Uh, first of all, they, uh, many of them are not yet born uh, at the time. And then they also mentioned that um, after the Umbrella Movement, there was a shift of identity among youngsters that they, they now identify them more as a Hong Konger instead of um, Chinese. And they think um, the Dream Force incident is more about the democracy in China, um, but like the Umbrella Movement and the Fishbowl um, Revolution is more about um, democracy democracy in Hong Kong. So um, my question is, what do you think of the, um, the shift or the change of um, perspective toward these two incidents, among, especially among youngsters in Hong Kong? Good Thank question. You very much. This touches right on your research. Right? Yes. Uh, I think this has to be read in the wider political context. Uh, but uh, that would be a very complex thing to explain here. Uh, the split between the pro-democracy camp and the uh, localist camp, uh, which started uh, around early 2010s, but really uh, 
really took shape after the Umbrella Movement um, because because of the multiple protest sites, Hong Kong, Admiralty, because there wasn't uh, success from the movement. So the uh, pro-democracy camp split into two, we can, you know, generally speaking, right? So there's uh, the veteran Democrats, you know, more, uh, uh, or how do you say, Dai Zhong Gai, in Chinese, you know, the, the ones who are using the older, older strategy to fight for democracy, and you have uh, the localists uh, who are more, uh, um, they want to separate from China. But separate, not in the sense of political separation, not necessarily pro-independence, but sentimentally they do not want to deal with anything related to China, even though they know consciously that if you want democracy, you have to negotiate with China, but emotionally they just don't want to deal with it. I think, and I think that underlies the reason why, uh, well, the localists do not want to participate in the uh, June 4th uh, vigil. Uh, very interestingly, in our own research, in fact, uh, even I think this hall itself was used as a, a place for student, uh, the Hong Kong U Student Union, to commemorate the June. For some time, the student uh, organizations did, but in their own way, in their own repertoire. Uh, what they did is that they do not contest with the story. They admit that you know they, we, it happened, it was a massacre, a lot of people died, but we're doing it differently. We're doing a talk, for example. This is what, so they, they reject the use of uh, 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 candlelight. Uh, I still remember. 2013, I think, in Hong Kong U, and uh, uh, outside the library, there was a commemoration. At that time, people were still using the candlelight. They bring the commemoration here in Hong Kong U because they say, we don't want to join. Next year, the candlelight is gone. And uh, the next year, then, it happened in a, in a hall, lecture hall, and invite speakers to debate about the meanings of, um, of June 4th. So I think they do not reject this. They accept the veracity of the, the historical account, but they would like to see it in a very different light. So I, I, so I, w I wouldn't say they forget about it, but they would do it differently, I would say. Um, you want to add something yeah. to that? Uh, yeah. I would just supplement a little bit about that. But uh, looking back, I mean, they are so-called new repertoire, so-called more deliberative, more interactive, was actually not that resilient with the so-called very ritualistic form that uh, we observed during the uh, uh, Tiananmen vigil at the Victoria Park. I think one of the reasons that we have supplement is that because apart from the identities and all these issues that Samson discusses, is what really happened after the umbrella movement, this kind of uh, sentiment, the decentralized sentiment. Okay, because I think why uh, the rituals has become so Resilience because there was an organ there has been organizations and the alliance in a way has played a great role in it. Okay, and, and so partly it's about this kind of they don't the top die call things like that in Hong Kong. That has been really important. Okay, and, and for them the ritual stands not only commemoration but because there's organizer and organizers the democracy force and that's why they are really against it. Okay, so it is not only about identity, I think this is also partly related to local politics, okay, the struggle between two forces. Thank you for that. Just a, an observation from me. I noticed you used the word massacre, someone else used the word accident, sometimes it's referred to as incident, sometimes it's crackdown. We don't even know how to refer to it sometimes. It's like an umbrella movement and umbrella revolution. Revolution, umbrella movement, occupy. Uh, I think there's a question coming from the far left. That's only a geographic term. <laughs> Sorry, I English is a limited company, so I speak Cantonese, and I want to ask Mr. Fu, uh, Fu San, Fu Kong Ngo Okay, okay. So, I'm going to say, 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 即係改革週年三十週年嘅大事嘅，有風波依家再
改翻、回歸翻佢個反革命暴亂呢個定式。咁如果係依家嗰個情況、個情況下咧，即係一個其實好多一啲相關嘅內地人都好，其實有部分好支持呢一個平息暴亂嘅。咁如果依家用呢啲咁嘅語調去喺網上發布呢啲支持官方嘅消息咧，會有咩後果咧？ I try to translate, but uh, uh, the question is about the uh, last year. They say the uh, 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 reform 40 years anniversary, and the government already redefined the meaning of the Tiananmen Square uh, crackdown as an anti-revolutionary uh, movement. Hang the sorry, uh, hang the revolutionary uh, movement. In contrast, we have uh, in the 40 anniversary that they would just. Described as a riot or or um, incident or uprising, but that basically escalates the whole level of uh, of framing of the whole issue. The, the question is basically at this moment because of this kinds of new reading definition, would it be even even more risky to post about the Tiananmen Square incident on social media? And I I. My, I, I think is uh, back to the um, uh, uh, first of all, thank you for the question. And my, my, my response is, uh, I don't believe the people will stop posing. I would expect that uh, in different occasions, there will be different forms that will continue to propose. And uh, maybe not on Weibo, they will uh, chat through WeChat in the private messaging system. And they even will use another different form to continue to pose of it. I think still a lot of people believe that just give a pose, that even to some of the very sensitive topics, is still a way to express their, their opinion. And mass of majority of people who pose are not arrested by the government. So this is a small number of very vocal and So I, I, I believe that would continue to do it. And I, I will keep it. Maybe I can just say a few words about your observation, Keith, that we don't even know what to call it. I mean, language is, it is important. And to say Tiananmen incident is also, this has become the sort of new nomenclature of the state. And, you know, I do think how we refer to it is important. I mean, an incident, as I say, is, is if I drop a cup of tea on the floor of my office, it's not uh, a government opening fire on its own people. You know, these were, this was an act of repression, an act of suppression, these were killings. And so I think we need to be careful about the language that we use. And I think it's really interesting to see how the, that kind of Chinese Communist Party language is creeping overseas into other places. And I noticed it particularly when my book came out because it was filed in the Library of Congress under Tiananmen Square incident. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. Why are we using this term incident? Um, so, yeah, that's something that I've noticed. And I think when we talk about it, we need to think about the language that we use as well. And one more thing, just one thing on my head, I was a student in HKU in 1997. At that time, when the uh, when the Chinese government really used really 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 Language of Can I just continue on that thought, just moderator, just for one second? Because I remember at the time I was, of course, not out here reporting on Tiananmen Square. And it became a point where the government denied anyone was killed at Tiananmen Square. So you saw a lot of the Western media saying students were killed in and around Tiananmen Square. And after a while, there became some dispute over the actual number, which went from thousands to hundreds to nobody knows. Do we know how many people were killed? No, we still, I mean, we still don't know how many people were killed, and there's been a, a variety of numbers that have been thrown around. I mean, in the in initial hours right afterwards, I think the state figures from the government were something like 250 people dead. At the time, the Swiss ambassador went around the hospitals, and the Red Cross came up with a number which was around 
2000, but it was later withdrawn. Uh, correspondents who were there said between uh, around 1,000-ish, but to, to be honest, nobody knows uh, even, even now, and, and particularly given the fact that there were, for example, there were deaths in Chengdu as well. Um, I think that figure, we still don't know for sure. That's one way that they try to wash or whitewash the memory by saying that we don't know how many people were, if any, were killed from the official accounts. <laughs> Uh, questions from the audience. Oh, right, and you had your hand up so quickly there. White shirt in the middle. She jumped out of her chair. <laughs> Thank you. My question about the uh, uh, Weibo scope, because the data you show and observation you show is actually before 2014. I would like to know about observation and data after 2014. And the second question is about, uh, at that time, uh, people use Weibo more. And, but nowadays, people should to go to WeChat and which a little bit more private compared to Weibo. Would you like to share out your observation about censorship? Thank okay. you. Excellent question. Thank you, you so much. She violated my two-question rule, but that's OK. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I try to combine the same one answer. OK, so uh, 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 yes, uh, I think 2014 is one of the turning point of the whole market of uh, social media in China. And more people are, have, have changed that the social media uh, usage epic from Weibo to uh, WeChat. And all, not just a changing of platform, and also, as you just mentioned, changing the move from more public to private. And also, if you can uh, remember in 14, that's a, quite a number of uh, significant crackdown on the, what we call the big week uh, people at that time, at that year. And that really create a lot of training effects of the people who start to, and also, uh, the government announced to, it will start to enlarge the cybersecurity law. And they and issue, keep issuing a lot of different guidelines since 2014. And basically, the year after the uh, Xi Jinping set up that uh, cyber, uh, uh, cyber security administrative office. So that whole spectrum of the movement that tried to push forward. And that exactly to change the habit to WeChat. And that's also why we set up another project called WeChat School this year. So we start to track the WeChat uh, public account information to follow the censorship issue. OK, we've got time for about two more. I see one here. And hold on one second. I'm going to go in the back there. For, is that Florence? Yes. <laughs> and then Bob, come down here. Thank you. Uh, flip a coin. Florence de Changer, I report for French uh, media, uh, Le Monde and the uh, French National Radio. I also had two questions, but I, I'll only ask the one which is useful to my story, which is about the role of Hong Kong in maintaining uh, and keeping this memory uh, alive. It's quite uh, exceptional, basically, that there is this little piece of Chinese soil which is still entertaining this memory, and I would like just further comments on this. Thank you. And how long can it last as well? How long will it last? How long will they continue to have these vigils here? Uh, I don't know. I don't know the answer. <laughs> I, uh, well, I, I think uh, one observation in, uh, by studying social movements in Hong Kong is that people learn about social movements and what happened in the past by joining social movements. It's a rather, you know, uh, tautology. It's a tautological thing. But the, the reason I say this is because from, you know, uh, People, when people join a social movement, what they do is they Google. You know, they Google about what happened, and they they, they want to find out what, what 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 went wrong. Okay, so I think it's a, the best the best tool is for people to join a certain movement. You know, in Hong Kong right now, it's very quiet, and uh, there there has been a um, a phase of demobilization after the umbrella movement and also after the fishbowl revolution in 2016. The cost of political participation has been driving up, has been driven up. Uh, there has been, you know, young people are less willing to go on the streets because they felt they have already slept for 79 days in the umbrella movement. Nothing had been achieved. And why would, and how would my participation change the world? So I think these are all the underlying problems. And uh, I think in order for this memory to pass on, uh, there has to be more tangible meetings, you know, on the streets in the public instead of just talking about on social media. I think more face-to-face -face, uh, 
you know, meetings would be, would be very important for people to share the knowledge together. That's why I think the vigil plays a very significant role still. No other comment on that? Well, okay. well I try to be uh, optimistically pessimistic. So what that means <laughs> is uh, I, I agree. I, I don't really know what happened. In, uh, maybe after a few years of that, we can't do anything. But uh, I think the worst case scenario is in China right now. People cannot have any kinds of open ceremony. They, have open, they can't do anything in public domain, but they can still use social media to tweet about it, even though at that time maybe Hong Kong had the same censorship system. I don't know, but at least you can't stop people to think about this whole thing. If everyone in this room, after a few years, we still remember this thing, and all to keep tweeting about it, keep talking about it, talk to your friend, Keep all the things still in the, uh, in, in the whole dialogue. I think it will continue, even though there's no such public event anymore. That's what we call the optimistically public distinction. Edmund, want to comment on that? Yeah. Uh, I think uh, our findings, first of all, suggest that rapid trust matter, meaning that you must come to the public and, and to experience and re experience and try to connect with different generations of artists, talk about the issues. And I think. Another message maybe to the local is because who's, who are really creating all these troubles or discussions now is really the rise of localism in Hong Kong. I mean, for the older generation, they still continue to come to there. And I don't think it is only about those who have not experienced, because since 2009, actually a lot of young people who actually didn't experience the movement, finally they got a lot of things from attending the vigils. But what I think the local is to think about what is really unique about Hong Kong is that we have an alternative public sphere and we have dissenting voice on issues on Chinese affairs and whatsoever. That is precisely what is really about defining Hong Kong. If they really care about what is really unique about Hong Kong, they should really think about it. And maybe actually the Tinam vigils, the candlelight, and if they still pass on for generation, that is how make Hong Kong somehow different from all the other Chinese cities. Okay, it's eight o'clock. I promised you one, is it short? Okay, one short one, because we started a couple minutes late. <laughs> okay. Hi, my name is uh, Brian Michael Gallen from Pandora Times. This is a question for Dr. Fu about uh, new technologies. So, about the application of machine learning and artificial intelligence in pre- and post-publication censorship. What impact could that have on discussion inside China and out? Okay, great question. And it does not come from my research. I, I quote some of the research done by the uh, University of Toronto, the Citizen Lab. They did a lot of um, research to try to uh, test the, the system. Right now, basically, basically what comes as kind of the sensor, they already found out uh, uh, there's a lot of um, uh, uh, machine learning uh, technique they're already using uh, to sensor, especially imaged. For example, they have already had a whole set of imaged. Uh, for example, one people told me, uh, one of just happened, one of the photo, that happened in a small corner, uh, uh, took a picture of Wang Dan, one of the uh, student leaders in the 80s. He is not the major character of that picture, but happened because the, the machine is free really sensitive to pick up every single face in the picture. That get picture can't get published. So this kind of technique is a, uh, it's a lot of evidence showing that they're using it. And I expect that will continue to work on uh, more in that different platform, but I'm still um, not 100% sure those pictures that I showed to you really and pretty subtle meaning that they really can't completely censor everything. Well, I want to thank the panel, Dr. King Wa Fu of JMSC here at HKU, Edmund Chung of Hong Kong Baptist, Louise Liam of the University of Melbourne, and our journalist in residence here at JMSC, and Samson Yin from Lingnan University. Thank you all. I'm Keith Richberg from the JMSC. Thank you. And, oh, and Hong Kong Penn, thank you for, for, for being here and co-sponsoring. <laughs>